Today I'll be showing how to use hardware PWM in Python programs in order to control the brightness of LEDs, and we'll also be talking about other useful information you should know when working with LEDs. Now if you're a first time viewer then I recommend watching my Practical Electronics 101 playlist, which is essentially a crash course on electronics and covers the fundamentals of electrical engineering but with a focus on using this knowledge for projects that I'll be doing in future videos. In particular, the video which is most relevant to what I'll be doing today is the one on transistors. In that video, I showed how to power LEDs using a transistor that's controlled by a Raspberry Pi and its GPIO pins, but I wasn't able to control the LED's brightness. Likewise, I also showed how to control a DC motor but wasn't able to control its speed. But thanks to PWM, we'll be able to accomplish both of these things. Originally, I was also planning to include motors in today's video, but decided it would be better to save that for its own video and focus on LEDs today, since they're more straightforward and will serve as a better introduction to PWM. In addition to the electronics playlist, I also suggest watching my Raspberry Pi playlist, which will get you caught up on how to set up your Pi along with Python in order to do what I'll be doing today. A written guide is also available on my website to make it easy to copy and paste the commands and code for the examples I've previously done. So let's head over there now and review a couple of things first. Here we see the schematic I used to power an LED using a BJT transistor in the previous videos. Again, if you want more detail on how this circuit works then be sure to watch my Electronics 101 playlist. However, today I've set up a slightly different circuit that uses a 2N7000 transistor instead, which is a MOSFET rather than a BJT. Here's the schematic of the circuit I'll be using today. A BJT would still be fine for PWM, but MOSFETs are usually easier to work with. This is actually the same transistor I used to control a relay in a previous video. But something I forgot to mention before is that even though MOSFETs don't require a resistor in between the gate pin and the Pi's output pin, it doesn't hurt to include a small resistor to help protect the Pi in case there's a short across the MOSFET. Generally this resistor can be anywhere between 100 and a few hundred ohms, but you don't want to go too high since there's a chance that it can prevent the transistor from fully turning on. Now let's quickly go over the other resistors in this circuit. The LED's current limiting resistor can be calculated based on the supply voltage you're feeding into the LED and the forward voltage of that particular LED, as I explained in previous videos. And finally, you also need a pull-down resistor at the MOSFET's gate pin to ensure it stays off when the program isn't running. Anything between 10k and 100k is a good value for the pull-down resistor. So that's how I connected the circuit. Let's now take a look at a few simple example programs. Like I've talked about before, there are a number of different Python libraries that can control the Raspberry Pi's GPIO pins. But the library I've been using is rpi-lgpio, and that's the one I'll be using today for hardware PWM. Now in most applications that involve controlling the brightness of LEDs, they typically take in information from sensors or other sources, and process this data in an algorithm which then decides how bright the LED should be. But since this video is an introduction to PWM, We'll just be running a few example programs provided in the documentation for this library. I'll include the link to this document in the video description. Now this section explains each of the functions that's used to control PWM, but let's go straight down to the first example and I'll explain what they do here. Now the first three lines are exactly like the previous examples I've done using GPIO pins. Here we're setting pin 12 as an output pin, and this is the first thing you'll need to do before setting a pin to PWM. Keep in mind the Raspberry Pi only has 4 pins which can be set to PWM, as you can see here, so feel free to use any of these pins. Now this next line runs the function that sets it as a PWM pin, 
and it also assigns it to a variable so we can reference it later. In this case, it's variable p. The first argument indicates the pin number, and the second argument sets the PWM frequency. Now for some reason they set this to only 0.5, or in other words half a hertz, which is incredibly slow. I don't recommend setting the frequency this low. For LEDs, generally speaking, anywhere in between 50 hertz and 1 kilohertz is a good PWM frequency. Higher frequencies are better because there's less flicker and smoother transitions when changing the brightness. But you don't want to go too high because you might run into problems depending what hardware you're using. For example, transistors become less efficient with higher frequencies, and if you go too high it's possible the transistor will overheat. Also, 1 kHz is already fast enough that most people won't be able to notice the difference with faster frequencies, although some people might be more sensitive to this than others. But like I said, anywhere in between 50 and 1000 Hz is common with LEDs. Now the next line of code is the start function, and this sets the duty cycle of the PWM signal. In the previous line, we assign that particular pin to the variable p. So that's why we see p here. The argument contains the number 1, which will set the duty cycle to 1%. This number can be anywhere in between 0 and 100. Setting this to 100 will make the LED be at its maximum brightness and setting this to 0 will turn the LED completely off. So assigning this to 1 like they did here would set the LED to its minimum brightness. Now the next line of code is the input function which waits for the user to press enter on the keyboard. This means the program will keep the LED on until you press enter, at which point it'll run the p.stop function which turns off PWM from that pin, and then gpio.cleanup, which resets the GPIO pins to their default state before ending the program. So now let's quickly run this before we move on to the next example. Like I've shown in previous videos, the best way to create new files on the Pi is by logging into it using an SFTP connection through your file manager. This way, you can use your preferred file editor on your PC to create programs on the Pi. Now, I'll create a new file and name it pwm-example.py. Then I'll open it with a text editor and copy and paste the code. However, I'll be changing the frequency and the duty cycle. I'll change the frequency to 1 kHz and then change the duty cycle to 10. Now let's run it. And as you can see the LED is now on but it's not super bright, which makes sense since I set the duty cycle to only 10%. Now I'll press enter to stop the program. Also you'll notice a warning message here. It seems there is currently a small bug in the gpio.cleanup function which produces this message. But as far as functionality goes, everything works correctly. So if you encounter this warning message, you can safely ignore it. But anyway, let's go back to the code and change the duty cycle to 80. Now I'll run it again and you'll notice the LED is much brighter now. Which again, makes sense since I changed the duty cycle from 10 to 80. But now let's move on to a more interesting example. This one includes a while loop with two for loops inside. These for loops use the DC variable to set the duty cycle. The first loop takes the DC variable and starts it at 0, as indicated by the first argument, and then it cycles up to 100 in increments of 5, as indicated by the third argument. Now the reason why the middle argument is 101 is because we don't want the loop to end at 100. We want it to end at anything over 100. So that's why 101 was used here. Inside the for loop, we see the change duty cycle function, which allows us to change the duty cycle after the PWM was already started. Then we have a sleep function which pauses the program for a tenth of a second. So in a nutshell, this for loop will first set the duty cycle to zero, then sleep for a tenth of a second, 
then set the duty cycle to 5, and then sleep for a tenth of a second again, then set the duty cycle to 10, and then sleep again, and so on. And it will repeat this until the duty cycle gets set to 100. Once the DC variable reaches 105, the loop will immediately exit before it sets the duty cycle, and will continue on to the next loop. Now this next for loop does the exact same thing except in reverse. The DC variable starts off at 100 and then decreases by 5 every iteration until it stops at 0 and ends the loop. Now since both of these for loops are inside a while loop, they'll continue to repeat indefinitely until you end the program. So the end result is that the LED's brightness will ramp up and down once every 4 seconds. Since the for loops are incrementing the duty cycle by 5 each time, it takes 20 iterations for the first for loop to go from 0 to 100. And since the sleep function is pausing for a tenth of a second each time, 20 times 0.1 seconds equals 2 seconds. And since we have two for loops, the total amount of time for one period is 4 seconds. Now let's run this code. So I'll copy and paste it, and actually I'll just remove the old example and paste this into the same file here. And again, I'll change the PWM frequency to 1 kHz. Now I'll run it. And as you can see, the LED's brightness is ramping up and down once every 4 seconds as expected. This time I've also connected a scope to the PWM signal so we can see how the duty cycle changes over time. I'll now pause the video while the LED is at its maximum brightness and we can see the signal is high the entire time. Now let's let it run for a few seconds and I'll pause it again when the LED is barely on. Now we can see the signal is high for only a small fraction of the time. Which should make perfect sense if you've seen my Electronics 101 videos where I first talked about PWM. But anyway, let's now look at the LED again and pay close attention to how its brightness changes over time. You might notice that the brightness isn't ramping up and down at a consistent rate. The amount of time that it appears to stay bright is longer than the time it spends being dim. And the transition from being dim to turning off completely goes by faster than expected. This is because the relationship between power and apparent brightness isn't linear, but rather it's logarithmic. The apparent brightness of a 1% duty cycle and a 20% duty cycle is a pretty large difference, with the 20% being much brighter than 1%. However, going from 80% to 100% actually won't be that much of a difference. 100% will be brighter, but the difference isn't nearly as much as the jump from 1% to 20%. This is the same concept as what happens with power ratings in audio amplifiers. At first you might assume a 40 watt amp is twice as loud as a 20 watt amp, but this isn't the case. The 40 watt amp is only marginally louder than the 20 watt one. In both cases, this is an example of diminishing returns. But this also means that if you want to set the LED to half of its maximum brightness accurately, you'll need to determine this through trial and error. Chances are, setting the duty cycle to 50% won't actually give you half of its maximum brightness like you might assume at first and you'll likely need to try a lower duty cycle. So in other words, it's difficult to accurately and predictably control the brightness of an LED since there's lots of factors that can come into play, including the transistor that's used and the current limiting resistor. It's possible to fine tune this by creating an algorithm that compensates for this, but this requires a lot of trial and error. This can especially be a problem when trying to accurately control the color of an RGB LED. RGB LEDs contain a red, a green, and a blue LED. And it turns out, any other color can be produced by using different brightness levels of these three colors. For example, let's play around with this RGB color slider tool. First I'll slide red all the way up. 
Now I'll slide green all the way up, and the combination of red and green gives us yellow. Now if I slide the green down to around 50%, we end up with orange. Now if I add some blue, we end up getting a shade of pink. So like I said, we can create any color using different combinations of these three colors. Well, this same concept applies to RGB LEDs. Instead of containing just two legs like a typical LED, RGB LEDs contain four legs. One for red, one for green, one for blue, and a common cathode pin shared by all of them. Now if we connect a separate transistor to each color, we can control each color individually by using three different PWM signals. However, like I just explained a minute ago, it's difficult to accurately and predictably control the brightness of LEDs using this method. Now, one potential solution is to use specialized constant current LED drivers instead of using traditional transistors. These ICs not only provide better control, but are also more power efficient since they don't have a current limiting resistor. And these are typically used to power many LEDs that are in series, including older generations of LED strips. However, there are better options these days. So in cases where you need to accurately and predictably control exact colors, you'll likely want to use the types of LEDs that are commonly found in modern LED strips. These newer generations of LEDs contain their own driver and controller, which can decode a digital communications protocol. For example, this strip contains the WS2812B LEDs, and these have three pins, a 5 volt power pin, a ground pin, and a data pin. This data pin can be connected to a Raspberry Pi or a microcontroller in order to control the color and brightness of the LEDs. Since each of these LEDs contains their own chipset, which can decode a digital protocol, they're able to produce the exact colors and brightness that you request from them. Each LED in the strip can also be controlled individually, so the possibilities are endless when using these modern LEDs. However, not every application will require such accurate colors, so the stuff I covered today is still useful and more straightforward to implement. It all depends on what you're trying to accomplish in your specific application. But as far as the more modern LEDs go, I'll be going into more details on how to control these in future videos. That wraps up today's video. Like I mentioned earlier, I'll be doing a part 2 on PWM, which will cover how to control the speed of DC motors. So stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed the video then be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also if you have any thoughts or questions about the stuff I covered today, then feel free to drop a comment. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.